Welcome to today's program on Impossible Planets with Dr. Peter Gao, hosted by Carnegie President Eric Isaacs. As a reminder, you can submit your questions at any time using the Q&A window on the ON24 platform. We will now begin with an introduction from Carnegie President Dr. Eric Isaacs. Welcome, everyone. Good afternoon. We're delighted to have you join us on this now entering even the third year of Carnegie's digital uh, science uh, series. Um, we, we launched the series, as many of you may recall, back in the spring of 2020 when we went into the, the pandemic. And it turns out it's become one of the, the great, um, a great piece of our repertoire, and we're going to continue it. And uh, hopefully you'll continue to join us. Uh, we, it gives us a chance to, uh, to allow some of our, our best scientific minds to talk about what they're most excited about today. And speaking of which, today, I'm really delighted to be able to introduce one of our newest staff members, Peter Gao. Uh, Peter is an atmospheric and planetary scientist. He just joined us at, in DC at our Earth and Planets Laboratory. Um, and his research includes many things, um, and you'll hear, hear a bit about that today, but it includes planetary atmospheres, exoplanet discovery, planetary formation, evolution, uh, and how ultimately how a planet can become habitable by life, and he does this by looking at a variety of interacting systems, as I've already mentioned some, to identify molecules that are called biosignatures, which could result from the presence of life on some of these planets. So it's really exciting today, and I think many of you know that, that um, we now have discovered over 4,000 exoplanets due to advances in instrumentation and telescopes, and many questions to ask about them, and we're starting to be able to answer them with these telescopes, such as the the, the density of these planets, the distance they are from their, their suns, their, their stars, uh, what their planet interior might look like, et cetera. And what Peter's really interested in is trying to understand how all of the planet uh, affects ultimately its atmosphere and learn something about its atmosphere. Now, why should that be interesting? Well, of course, the atmosphere itself carries uh, a lot of information about the planet below, but it also could indicate whether or not there's life uh, on the planet itself. Even though we may not be able to look at the surface, we can start looking at the atmospheres of those planets. Just to give you some examples of what Peter has done over the last few years, he's been part of uh, several teams, one looking at uh, the sulfuric acid clouds on Venus. These are clouds that dominate the atmosphere of, of Venus. He's looked at methane on Mars. It's when you see methane, you think, oh, life. But it turns out that not only can biotic processes form methane, but so can abiotic. It's an interesting thing. And then He's also looked at the so-called blue hazes of Pluto that include organic molecules, much like the smog on Earth, that may not carry life, but at least organic molecules. So today we'll hear a bit about what he's thinking about, what he's doing with regard to these atmospheres. He's, he's actually got time on, upcoming time on the James Webb Telescope. He may talk a bit about how that will affect what he can see uh, and, um, and how he will use that as a, a powerful tool. So just quickly, Peter earned his bachelor's degree in physics from the University of British Columbia and a PhD in planetary science from Caltech. He spent a year as a NASA postdoctoral program fellow at NASA Ames Research Center. Uh, he spent three years at Berkeley as a 51 Pegasi B postdoctoral fellow. This is a Heising Simons Foundation uh, um, fellowship. And of course, 51 Pegasi B was the first exoplanet actually observed, discovered and observed. And he subsequently spent a year at UC Santa Cruz as a NASA Sagan postdoctoral fellow and then joined us here at Carnegie. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Peter Gao. Peter? Right. Thank you so much, Eric, for that introduction. Uh, I am very happy today to be here to tell you all about impossible planets. But first, let's start somewhere more familiar, our own solar system. So at first glance, our solar system is neatly laid out. We had the small rocky things close to the sun and large gassy things uh, out in the outer solar system. Now, for a long time, we thought that perhaps this is how planetary systems are like throughout the galaxy and perhaps even throughout the universe. That is until we started looking and discovering uh, exoplanets. Indeed, to update Eric's figure, we've discovered now almost 5,000 exoplanets out there, and we think that there are actually billions and billions of worlds out there waiting to be discovered, to borrow a phrase from Dr. Carl Sagan. And what we found is that 
these exoplanetary systems really comes in all shapes and sizes. So to show that, um, here is a plot of exoplanet masses versus their orbital periods or their length of year. Now, to help guide your eye, I've put uh, where our solar system giant planets and rocky planets are. Uh, on this plot, they span these purple rectangles right here. The exoplanets uh, are shown in these dots. Now, the different colors and symbols don't, uh, aren't really relevant right now. They show different detection methods. But one thing to note is that the lack of exoplanets in the lower right corner is due to our detection biases. Our detection methods are currently not sensitive to the planets uh, in that part of the plot. OK, so looking at the exoplanets that are here, what can you see? Well, first, there are lots of giant planets, planets with a mass uh, of Jupiter or even greater. But there's also this interesting blob of planets down here that I've called the sub-Neptunes. Now, these are very special planets because they exist in between the giants and the solar system terrestrials. In a sense, their discovery shattered our idea of bimodal uh, planetary systems, planetary systems that are just small objects and large objects. Suddenly, there is now this missing link group of objects in between. Now, this presents an issue for us because we don't have any of these in the solar system, and therefore, we cannot just use our solar system objects as analogs of exoplanets. Uh, exoplanets. If we discover a giant exoplanet, we can think that perhaps there are just different versions of Jupiter. If we discover an uh, exoplanet that is about the size of Earth, perhaps it is similar to Earth in some way. What about planets that are in between? We don't have any examples like it here. And what I'll soon show you is that this population uh, is extremely important uh, in terms of planets as a whole. But before I get there, let's take a closer look at what these planets are. So what I show now is the planet mass now on the x-axis and the planet radius on the y-axis. And the sub-Neptunes are shown in these, uh, these gray dots. Accompanying these data are theoretical curves for how different uh, materials uh, are compressed under gravity and what size of planets they will form for a given mass. So for example, if we had a ball of pure water ice, this is a simplification. It's very hard to form planets that are pure water ice. But if they existed, then take, if they take into account their molecular structure and compression under gravity and pressure, then they would have sizes of a radii of a bit more than one Earth radii. Now, these curves help us help guide our eyes to uh, the, per, the uh, theoretical compositions of these sub-Neptunes. So what do we see? Well, it seems like the smaller or the lower, uh, the lower mass sub-Neptunes are similar to rocky bodies, perhaps just different versions of Earth, Venus, um, Mars, Mercury. But as we go up to higher masses, you, you can see how these planets start taking off from these curves towards larger radii. Now, there's not much stuff in the universe that can be solid that is less dense than water ice. And so for the planets that are lying above the water ice curve, you essentially need non-solid material, gas, like the gas giants in our solar system. So for these planets, we believe they are covered in thick hydrogen-helium atmospheres, hydrogen-helium being the most abundant elements in the universe. Okay, So right away, we see that the sub-Neptunes uh, are non-homogeneous. They're not just a blob in uh, mass period space. They have perhaps a diverse composition. So how important are sub-Neptunes? So here I show a histogram of planet occurrence, so just how often a planet uh, uh, exists as a function of planet size. And there's a couple of things to note here. One is that giant planets like Jupiter and Saturn are extremely rare in the grand scheme of things. Now, I know I showed earlier in the scattered plot of population that there seems to be lots of giant planets. Well, that, again, is due to observational bias. Our, um, our uh, methods of detection are just better at finding large planets. In contrast, the sub-Neptunes, which are in these two shaded regions, are much more abundant. It turns out, in fact, that sub-Neptunes are the most abundant type of planets in the galaxy under our current observations. Smaller planets could be more abundant or not, 
but our, uh, again, our current observations cannot say that for sure. But what we can say is that sub-Neptunes are much more abundant than the giant planets. Now, what else do we see? Well, the sub-Neptunes are not, again, a homogeneous population. They are divided into two groups, two peaks. Uh, and in the middle, there is a valley that we've called the Radius Valley. Based on density measurements, we think that the smaller group uh, in orange uh, are probably rocky bodies, and so we've termed them super-Earths. Uh, that's not to say that they are literally just Earth made bigger. They could certainly have much more complex interiors, but they are likely large rocky bodies. The uh, peak shaded in blue are termed mini Neptunes because we think that they are sl smaller versions of the giant planets with uh, interiors made of solid and perhaps even liquid material covered by a layer of gas. So I think this is one of the biggest discoveries in exoplanet science in the last decade, namely that one, sub-Neptunes exist, we didn't know that before then, uh, at least not in such abundance, and that they are in fact the most abundant type of planets in the, in the galaxy. And also that there are two populations separated by this radius valley. This gives hints as to how this uh, population has been shaped and how they've evolved and how they formed. And in fact, our current understanding is that sub-Neptunes are the products of cataclysmic atmospheric loss. So do I, what do I mean by that? And what does atmospheric loss mean? Well, it's right there in the name. It's when a planet loses its atmosphere. Now, Earth's atmosphere is pretty nice. We need it to survive. It will be really bad <laughs> if it was just lost to space. But we believe some Neptunes did lose, or at least some of them did, uh, a good chunk of the atmospheres to space. So how do you lose an atmosphere? Well, early in the life of a planetary system, the host star tends to be very active. Um, they would output a lot of UV uh, light as well as X-rays, and all this radiation impacting the top of the atmospheres of these nascent sub-Neptunes are enough to heat the atmospheres to such an extent that it boils off the atmosphere, okay? Basically, all the steam rising from a pot of water is essentially what's happening here, except the steam is, uh, the atmosphere is just blowing out into the vacuum space against the power of gravity uh, of the planets. So that's what's called photoevaporation, evaporation of the atmosphere due to photons. Now, there's also core-powered mass loss, which is when the core, the interior of the planet, is so hot due to initial formation that is able to, again, boil off the atmosphere. Both of these processes likely happen at the same time, uh, at such an extent that it removes a good chunk of the atmospheres uh, of these planets. So how would this uh, result in this radius valley? Well, one thing to note is that the densities of gases, perhaps not surprisingly, is very different from that of solid and liquid material. A planet that is 98% rock, so a rock core and 2% gas, is twice as big as if the rock, uh, if we were just looking at the rocky core. In other words, the, ma the gas, even though it's very, very low mass compared to the core, just expands out the space to such an extent that it makes the planet appear much larger. And so atmospheric loss and how it occurs on different planets at different places in, their, uh, different places in the systems gives us the radius valley. And this is one, uh, this is one example. So for example, uh, we have two planets. One of them is a little closer to their stars. They have about, they're very similar, but because one is closer, it captures more of that irradiation from the host star and over geologic time can lose their atmospheres. Ones that are farther away can hold on to perhaps one or 2% of their gas, uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, of their mass by gas. But again, that's enough to make the planets large. So suddenly you've created two distinct populations uh, one much larger than the other, and a dearth of planets in the middle. You perhaps also saw earlier that the more massive uh, planets tended to have more gas and be significantly larger than the, than the lower mass planets. Well, large, uh, higher mass planets can capture more gas and hold on to more gas just because they uh, have more gravity. And over geologic time, the more massive planets can keep their gas, while the uh, lower mass planets can lose all their gas. And so this is another way to create a lack of planets in the middle that has just sort of a middling amount of, of gas. That middling amount is very unstable and just gets lost to space. So long story short, 
sub-Neptunes are likely sculpted by atmospheric loss. And again, this is part of the part of the, the big discovery of exoplan uh, exoplan uh, exoplanet science in the last decade. Not only have we found this population that we didn't know about before, not only are they the most abundant type of uh, planet in the galaxy, but they've also in, uh, uh, experienced this truly cataclysmic event. So are the sub-Neptunes the impossible planets I'm talking about? Actually, no, this is all background. Uh, sub-Neptunes are certainly a very important population, but what we found uh, alongside sub-Neptunes are these oddballs that we now call super puffs. So this is the same plot as I did before. All I did was um, stretch the y-axis to much larger radii and added in some of these super puffs. The shaded area down below here, the blue shaded area is what I show them above. And you can see that su these super puffs are significantly larger than a lot of the sub-Neptunes of the same mass. Now, uh, for reference, some of these super puffs reach radii of 8 to 10 Earth radii, and that's about the size of Jupiter and Saturn. Now, Jupiter has 300 Earth masses of material in it, while Saturn is 95 Earth masses. These super puffs that have the same size only have about five Earth masses. So these are extremely low density objects. In fact, their densities are similar to cotton candy and styrofoam. Now, this presents a couple of problems. One is that they cannot just have a couple of percentage of their mass of gas. That only makes their, uh, that only makes their sizes twice as big as a rocky core. Now, they actually need tens, twenties, thirty percent of their mass uh, as gas. So that's a lot of gas, but you know you can you can perhaps form that. The real problem comes in how that atmosphere can survive throughout billions of years of their existence. So one thing we can do is calculate how long that atmosphere should survive given our current understanding of atmospheric loss processes, and then compare that to the age of their planetary systems, which we think is perhaps uh, not surprising, the age of the planets. And if we do that, we find that a lot of these planets should not be here. They should not exist. And so this inset shows the ratio atmospheric light time to the system age as a function of the age of the system. Anything that lies in the gray region should have lost all of their atmospheres a long time ago. And we can see that although some superpuffs could survive, and so these are uh, perhaps a different class of objects altogether, but there are objects that should not have survived that they should have lost atmospheres a long time ago, and yet they still have their atmospheres. So what's going on here? So this is where the atmospheres could offer the answer. So the atmospheres, as, as Eric talked about earlier, are extremely important. Not only do they capture um, clues as what's happening within the, uh, within the uh, planet, but they're also uh, the first things that we can observe from outside the planet. In a way, they are windows in the planet. Uh, planetary evolution. Now, atmospheres not only uh, uh, are not only interesting for offering clues; they're also interesting in their own right. Within atmospheres, uh, there are all kinds of very interesting uh, physical and chemical processes, such as the formation of clouds and hazes, or aerosols as a capture-all term. This includes the smog that Eric mentioned. There are also atmospheric chemistry and dynamical processes, as well as chemical and dynamical interactions within uh, between the atmosphere and the interior. And of course, we talked about atmospheric escape. So how do we investigate these processes? Well, if we're looking at solar system planets, it's relatively easy. I don't want to say actually easy, because uh, that'll probably make the people who send probes to these planets very angry. It's definitely not easy. Uh, but for solar system planets, we can send spacecrafts to them. We can launch probes directly into the atmospheres. For exoplanets, we cannot do that. They're way too far away. And so instead, we have to rely on remote sensing, capture of light, from these systems from very, very far away. There's a couple of ways to do this. We can capture light from the host star reflected off of these planets. We can capture light directly emitted by the planets. Usually this means heat from the interior, infrared light. Or we can capture light uh, from the host star that has been transmitted through the atmosphere and on its way capture signatures of atmospheric composition. And it's this transmission that I like to focus on. So, in order to capture transmitted light, we have to have a very specific geometry. The planet has to transit in front of the host star, uh, such as you see here in this cartoon in the lower right. Now, when this happens, there is a very sliver 
uh, around the entire planet, which is sort of the thinnest part of the atmosphere where the light can filter through. And how big and how uh, thick that annulus is is dependent on the puffiness of the atmosphere and how opaque the atmosphere is. Now, how opaque the atmosphere is is dependent on the wavelength of light we look at because different gases in the atmosphere absorb at different uh, wavelengths. And so if we're looking at a wavelength where the atmosphere is opaque because one of the gases is absorbing very much, then the atmosphere can look big. Whereas if we're looking at a, a wavelength where the atmosphere is relatively uh, transparent because nothing is absorbing, then the planet will look smaller. And this is how we get a transmission spectrum. We're essentially measuring the size of the planet as a function of wavelength. So the black curve you see here is a model uh, transmission spectrum. And you can see all kinds of wiggles and, and uh, peaks and valleys. Now, the, the general size of these features is dependent on how puffy the atmosphere is. And that, in turn, is dependent on a couple of factors, including uh, gravity, temperature, as well as the makeup of the atmosphere. The lower the gravity of the planet, the puffier the atmosphere, and the bigger uh, amplitude of these features. So what is this uh, transmission spectrum saying? Well, we can break down all these features by looking at what uh, gases could be causing these absorptions. Well, it turns out for this particular model, a lot of these peaks and valleys are caused by water, water absorption and the lack of water absorption. But there's also contributions from carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide. At shorter wavelengths, so optical wavelengths, 0.5 to 1 uh, roughly microns, there is also absorption by atomic sodium and potassium. Now, I failed to mention that this is a very hot atmosphere, about 1,500 Kelvin. Uh, and so here, these, um, uh, uh, these uh, materials are gases uh, at these temperatures. Now, the shortest wavelengths, we also have Rayleigh scattering. So this is what gives us our blue skies. Rayleigh scattering by atmospheric molecules uh, results in this slope at shorter wavelengths. OK. So transmission spectroscopy allows us to probe the, uh, the composition of atmospheres. Superpuffs have very puffy atmospheres, so we would expect large amplitude features, which is great because that really helps us in uh, capturing some of those this features with our telescopes. So we went out and looked at the transmission spectra of a couple of these uh, superpuffs. And by we, I meant the community. Uh, I didn't do it myself. <laughs> but uh, one example from Libby Roberts et al., a paper published in 2020, looked at Kepler-51b, a super puff, and we found nothing. So to guide your eye on this figure, uh, the colored curves show what we expected to see, these undulating features due to water absorption, in this case, water vapor absorption. The black dots uh, with the error bars, uh, uncertainties, are what we actually found. It is consistent with a flat line. So this was frustrating. And uh, I'm not show, I'm not going to show this, but we also looked at a couple of other ones. In total, we have four super puffs transmission spectra currently, and they're all flat. They're all flat. One flat, OK, that's maybe just uh, bad luck. But if they're all flat, that suggests a population level trend. So what can give you a flat spectrum? Well, perhaps you're looking at a very diffuse part of the atmosphere, and there's not much absorbing, and so you had no features. At the same time, you may be looking at absorption by large particles. And when I say large, I mean particles that are bigger than the wavelength of light. Now, in that case, uh, the particles absorb and scatter light um, in similar ways for all wavelengths, and you get a flat spectrum. And another possibility, although I'm not really going to talk about it, is that perhaps the atmosphere is actually not puffy at all, and that uh, it's filled with more heavy species, like carbon dioxide and water vapor, instead of just hydrogen and helium, along with trace amounts of, of water vapor. This is probably unlikely, because we know these, uh, these planets are very high, a very low density, and so we expect a puffy atmosphere. So given this observation and previous observations showing how big and low density the uh, superpuffs are, are there, is there an explanation for this? What can explain superpuffs, large sizes, and flat spectra? Is there sort of a, a magic solution? Well, there are two potential solutions. So one of them uh, are hazes, or smog, as uh, Eric alluded to. Another one are planetary rings. So 
how do hazes help? Well, now we have to think about the nuances of what, do it, what does it mean to know the size of a planet. Now, if you're on Earth, then the size of a planet is easy. There is a solid surface out there uh, that you can just say, OK, starting from here to the core of the Earth, that's the radius of the planet. But what does it mean for a gaseous planet that has a large gaseous envelope? Right? You can't just say, OK, well, I'm going to wave my hand somewhere in this gas, and this is where the surface is. There is no real surface. Right? There is a core way down below, but you're getting rid of a good amount of the planet in the process if you're just saying that's where the planet starts. So what really happens is we measure planets during transits, and at some point in the atmosphere, the light becomes opaque. So this little toy diagram essentially shows how that works. If you have a ray of light from the star transmitted through the planet's atmosphere at the very top of the atmosphere, that light's going to go right through. And we're not going to see that part of the planet, essentially. But as you uh, go to light rays that are going deeper and deeper into the planet, you get to a point where the atmosphere is so opaque that the light stops coming. And that's where you say the surface is. Now, in practice, uh, where that is is typically at a pressure level of a tenth to a hundredth of Earth's surface pressure. Okay, that's just how it works out given the compositions of these atmospheres. Given that we know this pressure level, we can also figure out how much mass gas, uh, how much of, uh, mass of the gas there is above that pressure level and perhaps below it, given the total density of the planet, and figure out how much gas there is in the entire planet. That's how we know that sub-Neptune most likely has a couple of tens of percent, uh, uh, sorry, a couple of percent of gas, and super puffs, in contrast, have a couple of tens of percent. But what if we're wrong? What if we're not actually looking at a few uh, or a tenth of a, of a Earth's surface pressure? Well, that can happen if you have a very high layer of aerosols or hazes that form from chemical reactions high up in the atmosphere. Uh, this is, we believe, ha this happens uh, a lot in planetary atmospheres, very high up at a pressure level of a millionth of the surface pressure of Earth. You can have chemical reactions between molecules like methane that get destroyed by high, uh, high intensity UV radiation that can then polymerize into small haze particles, aerosol particles that hang around and block light. So if that's the case, we're actually fooling ourselves and we're actually looking at a millionth of the pressure level. We're actually inferring, uh, we should actually infer much lower gas masses uh, in these planets. Uh, as a result, we're also going to infer a much larger size because we're looking at much higher altitudes than, than if the haze weren't there. Hazes are also, uh, haze particles are also larger than the wavelength of light. Not that much larger, but they're a couple of microns sometimes. Um, and there's not much air up there, right, at a millionth of a, a millionth of a bar, millionth of a surface pressure. So that kind of agrees with all of our uh, explanations, right? The haze makes the planet look bigger and also creates the flat transmission spectrum. So this is a nice solution. Now, what about rings? So this is the picture you saw at the very beginning. The rings essentially destroys our assumption that planets are round. Now, of course, planets are round, more or less. But their shadows on the stars need not be round if they have a ring, right? So if we assume that this particular planet in this picture is transiting and it's round, then we're going to massively overestimate its size. In fact, uh, the planet itself is relatively small, but the ring makes the shadow appear much larger. And the ring also covers up a good chunk of the atmosphere or protects the atmosphere from our prying eyes. And so much of the wavelength modulation that you see in transmission spectra is actually due to the ring. Now, if the ring is sufficiently opaque, then it's like looking at a wall. There is no wavelength modulation. Nothing changes with wavelength. Um, and you just get, again, a flat spectra. Now, one thing to note is that the ring is not a wall, of course. It's made up of a lot of different particles. But these particles are large. Okay? Particles, I shouldn't even call them particles at this point, but particles in the rings of Saturn, some of them are the size of houses. And so they're not really particles. And they're certainly larger than the wavelength of light. And so rings could also give uh, flat transmission spectra and um, can also make the planet bigger than it really is and requiring more, uh, more gas than is possible. And so these two explanations uh, nicely explains our impossible planets, but we need to actually test them. We need to test hypotheses, right? Unfortunately, our current observations don't really allow us to do this because both of these scenarios give us similarly flat spectra 
in the wave uh, in the wavelength regions that we can probe with, for example, the Hubble, uh, the Hubble Space Telescope. But luckily, we have a new telescope in town. The James Webb Space Telescope launched on the morning of uh, Christmas Day, East Coast time. I was sitting in bed, very, very nervous at 6.20 AM, watching this thing go off. The launch was nominal. Uh, I can say my heart was pounding, despite, I mean, even if it's, uh, it was nominal, my heart was pounding a mile a minute. My hands were cold and clammy and shaking. Because really, this thing right, was important for a good chunk of my career. And so if this thing went badly, then uh, I should be looking for another job. But luckily, it went well. The launch was perfect. It, in fact, better than perfect. I'll get to that in a bit. The uh, telescope has since made it safely to its new home at Lagrangian Point 2. And it has successfully unfolded. It is now undergoing calibration of its instruments and focusing of its mirrors. And so what did I mean that the launch was better than perfect? I meant that um, the engineers and uh, flight folks originally took into account perhaps some errors in the, um, in the launch itself, and that they needed to use up some of their fuel to guide the telescope on the correct trajectory. They need not have worried because the launch was right. They were launched right at the, the correct point, and now, uh, and, and that allowed JWST to conserve its fuel to the extent that JWST has enough fuel to last 20 years, which blows my mind because we now have 20 years of potential science to do with JWST. That's a good career. <laughs> so I also want to highlight this picture on the, on the right here, which is uh, amazing because it is the last view of JWST by human cameras, um, unless we, we send a probe, unless we send a, a reviewing mission at some point. But this is where JWST unhooked from the rocket uh, and went off into the, the wild black yonder of space. Um, moments after this, it, it uh, deployed its solar panel. Some of you might have seen this uh, on YouTube or if you followed the launch live. Uh, but that was an amazing moment, seeing the solar panels actually come out uh, and JWST reflecting the starlight, uh, sorry, the sunlight, um, oh, the sun's a star, <laughs> uh, becoming a, a beacon out there in the blackness. So how can JWST help us solve our problem? Well, first of all, it's just bigger, OK? JWST mirror is 6.5 meters versus Hubble Space Telescope's 2.4 meter uh, mirror. This means that it can collect more photons, collect more light, which gives us higher signal. Also important is that JWST is able to observe in the infrared. And so uh, this is in contrast to Hubble, which observes mostly in the UV, in the optical, and a little bit in the infrared. But JWST can go to much longer wavelengths. The plot I showed earlier where all the interesting molecular features are, the CO, the CO2, the water vapor, that takes place in the infrared. And so if we uh, have a telescope that can allow us to observe those features, then we can know a lot more about the atmospheric composition of super puffs, sub-Neptunes, and any other exoplanets we want to uh, uh, point, point JWST at. And so I took advantage of this. Uh, as Eric mentioned, uh, we got time on JWST to observe a super puff. And to do this, we had to write a proposal to propose for time for JWST. This is a plot that I put in the proposal sort of the, the, the vital plot showing our predictions of how well JWST can do to discriminate between the two uh, between the different models. And I'm happy to report that it was, success, it was a success. And at some point in the next year, uh, we should get data to try to, to um, figure out what these objects are. As I just want to describe this a little bit. Uh, it's a little busy, but uh, the different curves show different prediction for what could be in the atmosphere. Now, they... Um, uh, these include rings, which is the magenta line. So rings we think are just going to blanket everything. It's just going to be flat throughout the entire wavelength range, which is certainly disappointing, but is uh, an extreme end member of, of what could be. You have atmospheres that are made up of different things. That could be all super, uh, water vapor or have very heavy elements uh, or, or um, uh, heavier than hydrogen helium, I mean. Uh, these are unlikely because the atmosphere we know is puffy, but we're going to put it in there anyway because it does... Uh, it is consistent with the Hubble Space Telescope data. And then we have the, uh, the different haze compositions, which is in the red and the blue. Uh, 
Now, to get an idea of how good JWST is, uh, the uh, points are the data. Uh, the gray are the observed Hubble data. So this is data that we've captured. And the error bars are shown in the vertical lines. The black dots are the predicted JWST data. Remember, we haven't actually started observing yet. That's what we predict. And we predict that JWST will give us extremely high precision, much better than uh, HSD, uh, Hubble Space Telescope. Enough precision to tell the difference between all of these models. Okay. So there's a lot of interesting things here, um, uh, which I'll, I'll talk about very briefly. For example, uh, haze particles, even though they're bigger than molecules, they're still small enough that they can become transparent along the wavelengths. Uh, at that point, the particles become smaller than the wavelengths of light, and we can perhaps see through uh, the hazes and see something about the atmosphere composition. Hazes themselves uh, could also have features of their own. Not just molecules absorb and show these peaks and wiggles, hazes themselves could also have features. So for example, here, I, uh, uh, there's this haze feature that's labeled here, and that is typical of hazes that form from organic chemistry. Uh, for example, the breakup and polymerization of methane molecules. And so if we detect this feature, that will be pretty extraordinary because that will be our first hint of organic chemistry on an exoplanet. So with that, I like to uh, put up my takeaways. So, you know, if there's anything you take away from this talk, let it be these. Planets with size and masses between Earth and Neptune are the most abundant in the galaxy. These sub-Neptunes are sculpted into two populations, likely by atmospheric escape. Now, in contrast, superpuffs are low-density planets that make us question ideas of sub-Neptune formation and evolution, including atmospheric escape. But high-altitude hazes or rings may explain superpuffs' large size and their existence. And finally, we hope that JWST will be used to probe the atmospheres of superpuffs to test out haze and ring hypotheses. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you for coming. And I'll take uh, questions and comments. There you go. Thank you very much, Peter. That was that was great. Um, and we got a bunch of questions. And, and I'll shuffle a few of my own in. Um, mm -hmm. But let's start with maybe uh, maybe a higher level question about, you know, uh, you corrected me, 5,000 exoplanets. And <laughs> they're all quite different from our own solar system. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, and yet, are there of those solar systems? Are there many? I mean, the big question is: is are there many Earth-like planets, or are there planets that are roughly, you know, with one or two Earth sizes within a reasonable distance from the Sun, so that they don't have all these problems you discussed about too hot, too cold, the three little bears problem? So, yeah. what what is if you look at all of the all we can see so far, these systems? What is it? Um, are there ma how many planets have a chance of being like Earth? Yeah, there's, there's, I would say, a handful of planets in that category. Um, unfortunately, Earth seems to be just in the sweet spot for just the hardest to detect. It's small, and it's relatively far from the star compared to the planets that we found so far. Um, so a lot of these Earth, sort of Earth-like planets uh, don't actually revolve around sun-like stars at all. Uh, they revolve around M dwarfs or red dwarfs, these very small stars, because there, the habitable zones are closer to, closer to the star and it's easier to find them. So I think one of the, the most fantastic discoveries so far is the Trappist-1 planets. Um, they have, I think I've, they've been uh, on headlines, seven Earth-sized planets orbiting a small star, three of which I think is close or within the habitable zone of that star. Um, so those planets are definitely very interesting targets to look at, but M dwarfs are very active. And so these planets might face different challenges versus Earth-like planets. Now, there are, I think, a, a handful of other planets. Um, they have telephone number names, so I won't just rattle them off, but there are a small contingent of them now um, that are out there. Cool. Um, so let's see. We had a few questions about, um, about um, what mechanisms. Are there other mechanisms that would cause atmospheres to be lost, to be blown off of the... The, the surface of planets, and you had mentioned a few. One was a question, it was about solar wind, but are there also internal thermal processes in planets themselves that, that could give rise to the loss of atmospheres, and, and, um, and uh, what are there? Yeah, um, so I think that would include the core power mass, mass loss. So really that's because 
uh, when you form rocky bodies, you would smash rock, rocky bodies together and hope that they stick together and make bigger things. So this is a very vi violent process, and so make the cores extremely hot. And the, at the same time, you try to pile gas on them, you essentially just cook that gas off. So I would say that's probably the most uh, important one in terms of interior processes. Now, solar wind is certainly important. Um, there, you have charged particles that are coming in uh, and picking up part of the atmosphere and just like carrying it away. Uh, at the same time, you have the charged particles at the same time. But if you have magnetic fields, that helps protect um, the atmosphere. Um, so these are all, uh, there are several different, um, uh, these processes out there, yeah. Yeah. Um, so let's turn a little bit to biosignatures since you had talked a bit about looking for water and CO2. I don't want to call it the usual suspects, but the kinds of things you'd expect to see in an atmosphere. And presumably that's the first thing you would target, right? Um, mm -hmm. But there are, of course, I would I'd call them degeneracies, right? You can produce methane, mm -hmm. you can produce CO2 with yep. non-abiotically. So can you say a little bit about how much assurance would you need um, mm -hmm. to start really thinking that there's something down on the surface or even in the clouds themselves? I mean, when you think about, it's great to find water, but what does that really mean? terms of yeah. proof. Yeah, I think one of the myths of, uh, of, of biosignature is that water is rare. Now, water is everywhere. Uh, we see water all the time in the atmosphere for exoplanets. Um, right. So, right. right. And so we really need multiple gases that are indicative of some interesting processes going on down there. So for example, if you just find methane, that doesn't mean life. We, we, there's methane in the atmosphere, Titan, right? Titan's the moon of Saturn, plenty of methane in that atmosphere. It's not living, we don't think. Now, if you find methane right. and something that is oxidizing, like oxygen, at the same time, those two gases should just destroy each other, right? But if you, but they're both seen at the same time, it means some process, perhaps biological, perhaps abiological, uh, abiotic, uh, is keeping them apart. And so that will be our first hint that something very interesting is going on on that planet. Um, and along with that, the environment of the planet. Is the planet getting pelted by very high um, UV, a lot of UV, radiation that could result in these gases forming abiotically through chemistry in the atmosphere, or is the star relatively quiet? And so we really need to start thinking of the planet as a complete system and not just rely on individual gases. Yeah. Right. And, you know, one thing I've always thought would be really interesting is if you found molecules not found on Earth or found molecules that aren't commonly thought of as being like water, like CO2, like methane. Yeah. I mean, wh how are you thinking about that? I mean, Oh, yeah. The first person to find, see a spectra that you don't understand could be quite exciting. Oh, absolutely. I mean, if you see something that is not among our library of, of gases that we have measured absorption features of, that would be very strange. Um, and we certainly start looking for gases that could fit that. I would say another category along this, uh, this line of thinking are technosignatures, right? Gases that wouldn't regularly exist on a planet unless something or someone made it. So there was a recent paper that talked about um, CFCs in the atmosphere of exoplanets. If you see one of those, well, <laughs> that's interesting because they're mostly industrial, right? And so uh, right. that was certainly... The planet certainly could be, be of course, the planet could have already killed itself. So if they have too many that's CFCs, true. they may have already had <laughs> enough climate change that it's done. But yeah, exactly. so that, that's the kind of, I think that would be, yeah, that's a fascinating thing. Um, yeah. You know, getting back to the puffs, these super puffs, I mean, what's your sense of, of the... Of, of what you would look for in the super puffs in terms of life and biosignatures. I mean, is it mm. the same you would look for on, on say, rocky planets, hard rocky planets like Earth, or would it be different? Oh, it would be very different because uh, whether they have a lot of gas or small amount of gas but masquerading as a puffy planet, uh, they're still mostly gaseous. And even though they might have a rocky surface, that's way, way deep down at thousands of degrees. There's no way life that we know it can survive down there. But you mentioned earlier yeah. about life in clouds, right? And so these very low gravity planets could have clouds and, and haze structures that could hang around for a long time. And so this is very speculative, uh, but there are ideas, perhaps like in the clouds of Venus or even Jupiter, that you can have these cloud life cycles. Uh, but certainly we have to, it's, it's a very speculative idea, uh, how, to, how those life cycles yeah. actually work. So, you know, something you didn't have a lot of time to talk about, but I know is of interest to you is the sort of inextricable link between Earth, uh, sort of dynamics of, of a planet like Earth, like let's take plate tectonics, the subduction mm. of material, the material coming back out through volcanic activities, et cetera. Um, 
Can you say a couple of questions in this area? Can you say, first of all, how an atmosphere is generated in the first place, mm -hmm. right? If you take Earth's atmosphere, how did it get started in the first place? How did it become favorable or habitable for life, right? And yeah. what, how much do we know about that? And how much don't we know about that, I should say? Yeah. That's a really big question, really good question. So um, Earth likely had an initial atmosphere that was accreted from the nebula it was born in, so hydrogen and helium. But then, because Earth is so relatively small, it probably lost that over time. And outgassing from volcanoes or general just seeping from the ground, seeping from fault lines and magma oceans and impacts probably created this secondary atmosphere um, now, if you look at Earth right now, it's very different from the other rocky planets that have atmosphere. Venus has a thick CO2 atmosphere. Mars has a thin CO2 atmosphere. So Earth is a bit of an odd one out that it, it has CO2 and, and certainly a problem right now, but it's nowhere near as thick as, or dominant as, as on the other planets. So the idea, I think, is that perhaps early Earth also had a thick CO2 atmosphere. That's one idea uh, with some nitrogen. But the problem is it's hard to find evidence because most of the rocks uh, uh, during that time is gone or has been altered, right? Uh, unlike Mars that has surfaces pristine from 4 billion years ago, we don't have that. So very little uh, evidence still lasts that tell us about the atmospheric conditions back then. All we can do is guess. Uh, we know there's liquid water way back then, so it had to have a thick enough atmosphere to allow liquid water to persist on the surface. So that's where CO2 comes in. That's when N2 comes in. And then over geologic time, the development of life, the development of photosynthesis slowly converted that CO2 heavy atmosphere and nitrogen heavy atmosphere to our current atmosphere, which is still nitrogen heavy, but the second most abundant gas is oxygen. Yeah. I mean, one, one of the interesting things about what you're doing, of course, is you know the, the solar systems all are of different ages. Their, their parent star is mm -hmm. some of them very young, some of them older. In fact, yeah. I just read a paper recently where they claimed that a dying star could give birth to, to, to planets as well. Yeah. Does that give you a sense of, of the, the sort of fourth dimension? I mean, do, do you, are you able to do longitudinal studies just by looking at different, you know, now, now that you, we have over 5,000 planets identified, mm -hmm. can you do longitudinal studies to start understanding some of these? Presumably when you can measure their atmospheres in a reasonable way. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. Yeah, so the power, I mean, exoplanets are far away. So the signals that we get, the observations that we get for a single planet might not be great, but they have power in numbers. And so there is a growing number of very young planets. So millions of years old, you know, in, in contrast, Earth is 4.5 billion years old. So we're really looking at very young planets. These are planets in the initial stages of formation. Uh, we have planets that are still embedded in their protoplanetary disks that are accreting gas, and we can see them accreting. And so by looking at, I think, the younger planets, you can actually see these initial developments and the atmospheric loss, right, that converts uh, many Neptunes to super-Earths. We can actually see that happening right now. And so um, discovering more young planets, measuring their atmospheres are certainly vital for constraining how these planets came to be. Because once they've, after the first couple of maybe 100 million years, they kind of settle down and just slowly cool yeah. over time and... That's not so uh, interesting, but early on, you know, things are happening. Yeah, I mean, one question that's also come up, which is related, is can can planets regenerate their atmospheres? So, in a way, mm -hmm. you kind of intimated this before. The Earth has been through several atmospheres, right? It's been continuous, mm -hmm. but part of that has to do with things like tectonics and mm -hmm. the exchange of material between the surface and the and the and the, and the bulk of the planet itself. Right. Is there any reason to believe that a, a, you can get a planet that may lose its atmosphere and totally regenerate or just go through a full uh, a, a sort of re replenish or renew its atmosphere? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, the early atmospheres of, of planets are, are uh, certain likely sourced from the nebula. Um, whatever comes afterwards, if they lose that atmosphere completely, will depend on their techno tectonic regime. If their surfaces are, it's easy to develop volcanic volcanic hotspots or spreading centers or any of these tectonic uh, activities, then it will be easier for them to outgas what's in their mantles, right? Versus what they call a stagnant, stagnant lid regime, which is just, as the name suggests, a lid of crust on top that doesn't let anything out, uh, which will be very bad for regenerating atmospheres. Uh, but yeah. that's the yeah. cool thing about these secondary things is that it tells you about the interiors, uh, which is hard to do. Yeah. So let's turn a little bit to the instrumentation, the telescopes, mm -hmm. and yeah. 
this question was going to have to be, <laughs> which is comparing uh, uh, ground-based versus space-based, mm. JWST. Can you say a little bit how they complement each other, how they're different, mm. how, in particular, in the context of exoplanets and exoplanetary atmospheres? Yeah, that's a great question. So both uh, both space-based and ground-based uh, telescopes have bring their own uh, bring their own advantage to this. Uh, certainly, space telescopes don't have the atmosphere to worry about. The stars don't twinkle up there, and so you can observe over a much wider wavelength. But you have to launch it, and so it can't be that big, and it also can't be that new of technology. You can't just slap together something in the lab and then put it on the telescope and hope it works out there. It has to go through years of testing. Um, and so Earth-based telescopes first can be much bigger, right? It's going to be very hard to launch a 30-meter telescope. Uh, you can also build something in a lab and trial test it at observatories like Las Campanas and see if it works. Uh, if it does, great. If it doesn't, take it off, put it back in the lab. It's all fine. Uh, so that's one part, a uh, very general part, where these two uh, complement each other. Another thing is that it, what the Earth uh, uh, the ground-based telescopes can do that really well is high-resolution spectroscopy. So this is really, um, you know, in the earlier class I showed these wiggles up and down, those are actually absorption bands. And so we've kind of averaged over all these absor uh, very tiny absorption features because we just don't have the spectral resolution on these space telescopes. On the ground, we can have really high resolution, and you can, instead of seeing this broad band, you can see the actual individual lines of all these absorptions that are happening in these molecules. And that's important because then you can really say something about what these molecules are actually doing, the temperatures, the velocities. In fact, some of these ground-based telescopes have measured winds, wind speeds in the atmospheres of exoplanets, which I think is just amazing, right? The actual weather report, oh, winds out of the Northeast on HD 189733B, yeah, yeah. right? You do that, you can only do that on the ground yeah. right now. So that's, yeah. that's very cool. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's very cool. I mean, that also related question, which is, um, you know, measuring the... Um, planetary rotation by looking yes. at the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the Doppler effect is tiny when you're talking about uh, even even the, the IR wavelengths you're looking at. But uh, I guess that's you've kind of answered that question. You can see motion in the, yes. in, the yes, uh, in the atmospheric conditions that make it possible to measure things that are moving. So that's mm -hmm. pretty cool. Um, yeah. So what would be, uh, we have a few more minutes. I'm going to ask a few more questions and then, and then finish up with a few of my own. But what would be, the, what is the first thing you're going to look at when you uh, get your time on JWST, what planet are you going to look at? You already have that scheduled. I mean, you don't have it scheduled. Yeah. You already have it planned. So what are you going to look at? Yeah, so um, I'm leading the Super Puff study that I showed at the very end. So that will be uh, where my heart is for the good chunk of the first year. But excuse me, yeah. I'm also fortunate to be involved in, uh, I think, eight other programs, including uh, the, large, the largest exoplanet program in, uh, in the first cycle led by uh, Natasha Patalia, NASA Ames, and our own Johanna Teske at Carnegie EPL, uh, looking at uh, the first type of planet that I talked about, the sub-Neptune. So they're going to look at 12 sub-Neptunes, and it's really um, a way to try to figure out what these things actually are. And so those will be, uh, again, another one of my focuses in the first year. Now, of course, cycle two is coming too, right? That was only first year. Yeah. The, the deadline for cycle two of JWST is... Uh, it's, uh, I think, about a year from now, and I already got some ideas up here that uh, I'm going to keep it sealed in here for now. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to give away any uh, any corporate exactly. secrets at this point, Peter. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I should say, just, just because uh, President of Carnegie, that Carnegie scientists, including Peter, got an inordinate amount of time on JWST this first cycle. They're very proud. Johanna being one of them. You mentioned Johanna. Yeah. Um, to do some of the exoplanetary search that she does, but it's we did really well on on this telescope. So, in future lectures, in future virtual lectures, we'll have we'll cover more of what what you're talking about here. Um, uh, let's see a, a couple questions um, that have come up, also kind of keep coming up, I guess. Here is is when you think about uh, you, you talked about the statistics of of planets, right, and how kind of special the solar system is. Can you say a little bit more about the statistics behind, you know, this bifurcation? And you you mentioned the difference between bias. We're of course biased toward planets that are close and massive because, you know, we can certainly use radio velocity methods, and uh, and also it's much easier to see uh, transits that way. But we have enough statistics now, it seems, <laughs> that we can start projecting what the real distributions look like with what we have so far. So can you say a little bit more about? <clears throat> 
about what, what the actual limitations are and what they will be to actually start mapping out the architectures mm -hmm. of, of all the systems we're finding? Yeah, uh, so I mean, you're absolutely right that uh, radio velocity uh, uh, measurements have now allowed us to extend out to roughly Jupiter distances. And in fact, there was a recent study showing that there is sort of a bump in planet occurrence at around uh, Jupiter distances around these stars. So that's a very, very cool study. Um, I think uh, our limit right now is still the small guys. So it really is hard, certainly radio velocity, to detect anything Earth mass or anything like that uh, beyond Earth's orbit. It's, it, it's, it's just very hard to detect anything out there. And it's, because of that, it will take time and perhaps it will take a really long time to get the statistics. Now, that said, there are plans in the works for doing it another way, through direct imaging. And so this is uh, sort of the, the, uh, the telescope, I think, two after JWST, where they will try to directly image planets in the habitable zones of stars, of other stars. And so there, of course, that's very exciting because you can actually see another pale blue dot out there, perhaps. But then at the same time, you can map out the distribution of planets at sort of farther away distances and also smaller sizes. And as you dig towards the smaller sizes, you'll get a smorgasbord of larger planets for, the, you know, for free, essentially. And so uh, really in the next 10, 20 years is where a development of this is going to skyrocket. Yeah. That's great. So I'm going to ask one more question, um, which, believe it or not, our, our audience has withheld from, but since they rarely get a chance to talk to an expert who models, mm -hmm. uh, and I know scientists will tell you they don't want to predict unless they can at very least model it. Mm -hmm. What do you think the chances of actually f us getting – uh, getting close enough to saying there's a high likelihood of life on another planet, not in our own solar system, but on another solar system. Do you think that in certainly maybe not my lifetime, maybe yours, Peter, that's going to be possible? Um, and, you know, if so, you know, it certainly will change the way the world thinks about itself. But what do you think the odds of that are? Again, I know I it's not the, a fair question yeah. to ask yeah. at some level, but go ahead. Well, I'm a sci-fi fan, so, you know, <laughs> I can dream this stuff. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I would say that, well, I think the odds are, well, let me put it this way, right? Like, what are the instruments that are going to go up uh, on sky soon, right? JWST will get us to the place where we can start getting information about these atmospheres for the closest best targets, the Trappist-1 planet, for example. It'll be very hard to look for biosignatures, but we'll, we might get something. We'll get maybe tantalizing hints that something is there, perhaps. And so that's kind of, you know, that, that scenario is within the next 10 years. And then you have uh, the large, so the LUVAX or you know, the large telescopes that are going to launch in the 2040s that are supposed to uh, allow us to direct image planets, direct image habitable planets. And so there you might see this, right, this um, pale blue dot. And you can not just image, you can also get spectrum and tell us what's in those atmospheres. That's what these, planet, uh, these telescopes will be designed to do. And so you know, by 2050, I would say if everything stays on schedule, I know JWST was delayed a lot, so that's a caveat. Um, we might start getting um, hints that there are these pale blue dots out there that may be inhabitable yeah. or, or whatever, provided they exist. So now we're really uh, at the mercy of what nature actually has out there and what's going to throw at us. You never know. You always end up with more if questions you, than answers. <laughs> I mean, if you were on uh, a Trappist, one of the Trappist planets, and looked mm -hmm. back at Earth, what would would you be able to say about Earth? Would you be able to? Oh. Would you feel you know you know too much because you're on Earth? But if you were looking back at Earth, you know what we see in our atmosphere, which is part of the reason you have JWST mm -hmm. up in space, yeah. a million miles away. I mean, would you be able to conclusively, by looking at Earth's atmosphere, say there's something going on down there? I think current study shows that if you have these big uh, 2040 telescopes, you can. You can you can say you can't detect city lights or anything. I don't think, but you can detect right. oxygen, right. ozone, and methane and CO2. And you can say that oh, this is a very interesting atmosphere, and that perhaps uh, it fits some definitions of biological processes. That's all I can say, right? I mean, it's hard to say for sure. Okay, there's definitely low green men down there. Uh, that would take a whole different. I mean, that takes a level of confirmation that I don't think we have yet, right? I think there's, there's beginning to say, okay, what are the standards of the detection of life? I don't think that exists. We have to think about that question yeah. first. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, this has been really great conversation, great talk. Uh, Peter, Thank really you. appreciate it. It really hit the spot. And 
think we're going to have to, and now we've got plenty more questions. I'm sorry we can't get to everybody's questions in the audience, but uh, we'll pass these on to Peter and uh, his spare time between JW, JWST runs. Maybe he can answer some of them. Um, I sure. want to thank you, Peter, for really a terrific talk. It was great. And thank I want to thank our audience for their continued interest in, in, in our science, in the science that Peter's talking about, and fantastic questions. And I apologize we couldn't get to all of them. So thank you, everybody. And uh, and goodbye. <laughs>